So hello everybody who's joining us. We will start in about 30 seconds. Uh, we would just like to allow everyone to make their way to our virtual meeting room. We are very happy to see that not only today's panel is spread across the globe uh, with speakers joining us from Singapore, from India, from South Africa, from Germany, from Belgium, and hopefully uh, soon from Brazil and the US. But that our audience is also mirroring this diversity. Uh, so thank you very much uh, to all of you already for making this time, making time for us in your mornings, afternoons and evenings to be with us. We're very happy to have you. And I can see the numbers going up and we'll start this. Again, hello. My name is Sabine Donner. I am co-directing and coordinating the Transformation Index project at the German uh, Bertelsmann Stiftung. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to this third session of a series of webinars that we are co-hosting with our sibling organization in the US, the Bertelsmann Foundation. Um, Tony Silberfeld, Director of Transatlantic Relations for the BFNA is here with us and will take over later the, the um, question and answer section. The series is centered around the findings of the BTI, a global expert survey on political and economic transformation, as well as governance performance in 138 countries. Um, and while the BTI produces an abundance of quantitative data as well as country specific um, narratives on processes of change. Um, and while we are putting a lot of effort, effort and emphasis in ensuring the validity and rel reliability of our data, we are driven by the conviction that producing and making these data available is a beginning of a process uh, at best uh, start to a conversation and not the end to it. Which brings me to express our gratitude to the World Justice Project um, for agreeing to also co-host this meeting with us today. I think our organizations share a common approach to the indices we publish, um, the Transformation Index and the Rule of Law Index. I think we share the ambition to measure tremendously complex and multidimensional issues and produce high quality and transparent data um, while at the same time, we share the necessary humbleness to understand the limitations of expressing these complexities in numbers and the conviction that one of the many merits of doing it anyway is to raise awareness and start a dialogue on issues that are of utmost relevance for every country and citizen around the world. Uh, and this is what we are about to, to do. But there's not only a closeness of conviction between our organizations, uh, but also one of personal and professional relationships. Ted Picone, who will be sharing uh, the roundtable today, is Chief Engagement Officer at the World Justice Project, where he leads uh, the organization's efforts to advance the rule of law through strategic partnerships, convenings, advocacy, and locally-led initiatives around the world. Uh, at the same time, he has also been one of the, I think, BTI's most long-standing supporters right from the very first edition that we published in 2004. Um, he's a member of the BTI's advisor board. We have always appreciated his thoughtful and knowledgeable advice, as well as his friendship over all these years. Uh, and it is admirable to see how he manages to combine analytical rigor and expertise with a very passionate approach and advocacy for human rights, democracy, and the rule of law around the world. So thank you very much, Ted, for not hesitating a second when we ask you if you would do us the honor of chairing today's roundtable. Ted has been instrumental for today's event in more than one way. First, in bringing together this outstanding panel of experts that I will be introducing to you in a moment. But he also is the one who gave us the inspiration for today's topic in the first place. In 2016, Ted authored a book with the title Five Rising Democracies and the Fate of the International Liberal Order, in which he convincingly argues that in times of shifting global power balances, the answer to the question whether the international order will be based on shared values of human rights, democratic governance, human dignity, will depend on the role that five pivotal then democracies choose to play. Brazil, India, Indonesia, South Africa, and Turkey. 
Um, and we sort of distorted, and I'm sorry about that, uh, his title um, for our webinar today to make it a bit provocative because the shifts had, have, the tides have shifted a little bit. But why did he pick those four, five countries? Uh, no doubt they are big, important countries, regional powerhouses, uh, they represent a quarter of the world's population, but even more importantly, they all have made tremendous strides in their own transformation from, from illiberal, closed governance to more open and accountable systems, embarked on a relatively stable trajectory GDP growth rates um, that has been consistently above global average and have expanded their welfare systems, uh, lifted millions of people out of poverty. A tremendous achievement. Um, and in light of these tremendous gains in transformation, many observers had hoped that these five countries could be the new standard bearers of multilateralism, promoting human rights, rule of law, democracy worldwide, um, and contribute to establishing a true North-South partnership based on common norms and systems. I will leave it to Ted later to elaborate on the geopolitical and foreign policy dimension of this equation and why we, he took a more cautiously, though still optimistic, stance in his book uh, back in 2016. Suffice it to say today, a global regression of democratic achievements, the backsliding of many established democracies of the West and an even more fragmented international order have sobered many of the expectations. The results of the BTI are indeed sobering Past decades was marked by a significant erosion of participation rights, rule of law, volatile economic development, consistently high level of social inequality, and widespread bad governance. Um, and most of these problematic developments on a global stay also apply to various degrees to the five countries we are going to talk about. Uh, so what does that mean for their own trajectories in the future and the future of the international order? globally. We invited five excellent experts on each of these countries to discuss this today. We are grateful that they accepted the challenge to cover such a broad topic. Uh, we couldn't be in better hands because our speakers all have something in common. Uh, what they bring to the table is not only profound knowledge of the national, political, economic, social development of the five countries, but they all have a distinctive perspective in their work on foreign policy agenda as well as their role in the international order. So thank you again very much for being, for joining us today. Let me quickly introduce them to you. Elizabeth Sidoropoulos joins us from Johannesburg and will add the South African perspective to our topic. She is Chief Executive of the South African Institute of International Affairs since 2005. Joseph Liao is Tanka Key Chair in Comparative and International Politics and Dean of the College of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Um, Seda Gürkan is lecturer at the Department of Political Science and European Studies Institute at the Université Libre de Bruxelles and one of the BTI's country experts on Turkey. Um, we are still waiting, I think, for Oliver Stunkel. So uh, hopefully he will join us from Sao I'm Paulo. Here. Ah, okay, I'm sorry about okay. that. Oliver is an, <laughs> great to have you here as well. Uh, Oliver is an associate professor of international relations at the Fatulio Vargas Foundation in Sao Paulo, where he coordinates the Sao Paulo branch of the School of History and Political Science and is also a non-resident fellow at the Global Public Policy Institute in Berlin. And last not least, Constantino Xavier is a fellow in foreign policy studies at Brookings India in New Delhi and the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. Again, thank you very much for joining this conversation. We are very excited to have such a, a tremendously uh, distinguished panel. So we have a lot of ground to cover within the next 90 minutes. We wanted to give you a rundown briefly on what it's going to look like. I have the great pleasure of setting the scene with a brief overview of the BTI and um, um, Burgessic Project Rule of Law Index data on the short and medium perspective. Where are the countries now as we see it and where do they come from? Um, Ted will then kick off the roundtable with brief introductory remarks on the geopolitical context um, and, and the state of the international order um, and what that means for democracy, human rights, multilateralism. 
and will then engage uh, into something that we want to make virtually. Uh, we are not sharing a table, but we want to have a round table uh, on these topics. For the last 30 minutes, we will turn to you all um, for an audience Q&A. One important bit of housekeeping now, at the bottom of your screen, you should see the toolbar with the Q&A function. Please feel free to use it at any point uh, during the session when you come up with a question. It would be helpful to us if you try to be concise and short and brief. And if you have a specific question that you want to address to one of the speakers, please mention that so it will be easier later to, to address your question correctly. Uh, and with that, let me start with some brief remarks and introductions on the, um, and bring up some slides on the results of our indices. And I'm starting right with political transformation. This is BTI data from 2010 to 2020. Uh, as you can see, um, all countries, um, quality of democracies has been uh, regressing in the past 10, in the past decades. Most pronouncedly, Turkey, um, who is for the first time in this BTI categorized as not a democracy anymore, uh, but a moderate, moderate autocracy that poses, of course, a whole new set of questions, um, what that means for, for um, their absent, at, at the moment, nationally absent stands on democratic uh, progress. Um, Lots of the tendencies I'm describing you um, in a moment, or summarizing you in a moment, can be sort of Turkey is sort of the poster child in a bad sense of the world uh, because um, the, the backsliding and the regression has been gradually uh, accelerated after the, um, the attempted coup in 2016, but has started before that already. Um, the country that, let's say, um, regressed the least was, is South Africa, actually. They more or less could, uh, are in the same position, are now the leader of the pack. Uh, I think we have to mention that Brazil, India, which seem to be on a very um, a slow but sure path towards consolidation, um, which add into 2010 still seemed to be irreversible um, that they would consolidate their democracies more or not uh, consolidate, dropped out of this category in the BTI and are now behind, placed behind South, uh, South Africa. Um, so uh, what we can see, I think, observe is that polarization and populist uh, national leadership does not bear very well on the quality of democracy. We do see a tendency of a concentration of power in the executive uh, that goes along with uh, instrumental, uh, instrumentalizing nationalist, populist um, uh, cleavages that exist. Um, and we do see, and I will go to the um, World of Justice uh, Index results for that, for each and every country. What we do see and what is remarkable is that the uh, most pronounced um, setbacks are happening in what we are calling a political participation criteria, or what the um, rule of law index is measuring in fundamental rights. So the basic um, rights of political participation um, have been digressing the most. With the exclusion of South Africa, all countries um, uh, are affected by that um, and have deteriorated in that. If we are looking at the World Justice um, Project's uh, Rule of Law Index, which is, if you don't know it yet, a granular and impressive and amazing attempt to measure every dimension that rule of law has. Of course, not only it has not only a political dimension, although I placed this here, um, it also has an economic and governance dimension. But just to illustrate a couple of trends that we can we could see 
Uh, South Africa, as I said, is the country that is um, the least affected or not affected at all by deteriorations um, in the constraints on government power, the concentration um, in, in government, um, and is actually with a ranking um, of 45 out of 200, uh, 128 countries uh, doing fairly well and has in the short term even um, improved in the um, in the um, uh, overall rule of law score. Indonesia is the country that in the BTI has also digressed the least. There's a short term trend in the rule of law index where um, the, the, there was an overall increase in the past year. Uh, Indonesia, and I would be interested to hear more from our uh, panels list later, um, seems to have a very resilient um, um, separation of power checks of balances system that seems to work uh, even in a time where the neighborhood everyone else is, has, shows increased authoritarianism. Indonesia has seen an improvement uh, when it comes to the constraints on government power. Um, Brazil shows a, a very pronounced decrease in the rule of law index overall. Uh, notable decreases, like I said, in fundamental rights, uh, freedom of accession, uh, um, of assembly, freedom of the press, um, a trend that we see in all remaining countries now and in a lesser degree also in South Africa, like I said, um, the violence, uh, harassment um, against journalists is is um, um, has been has been one of the points uh, that we can mention here. But also the the attempts of countries to suppress dissent and critical voices in civil society um, by legislation, by harassment of um, NGOs, by uh, and also that is true for India, for example, by, for example, legislation that is uh, regulating the foreign funding of NGOs, which is essential to, to many of them, uh, trying to, um, if not outright um, um, disallowing it, but then controlling it tightly. Um, there is a, a law, for example, that has been um, uh, that that is um, uh, regulating that um, foreign-funded NGOs um, have to be based in India, make, making the um, making it closer to to or bringing it closer to government scrutiny. Turkey, like I said, has shows the, also in the rule of law index, um, has only improved in one factor in the la over the last last five years, which is criminal justice and these aspects. Uh, it does show the most sobering pictures of these five countries. Uh, significant declines in, like in the VTI, in all factors over the past five years. Uh, and is now ranking last regionally in, in um, four of the uh, eight factors the rule of law is measuring. I have to be quick now so that we have enough time to discuss. Let me show you a picture of the economic transformation and some of the things, of course, relate, uh, as I said, have an impact from the rule of law index as well. The rule of law index states that all countries except Turkey have remained strong in regulatory environment. Um, and we see that in the BTI as well. The picture is not as sobering as the uh, picture of political transformation. The um, changes that you see are mainly driven by um, a uh, deterioration in economic performance. Brazil uh, was in a 2015-16 in a in a wide recession, um, and uh, so this is something that that is remarkable 
uh, Indonesia has been is the only country that was able to improve its uh, trajectory in the economic transformation. Um, this is all I have to mention that pre-COVID, of course. So I'm not sure what kind of a picture we see probably in many of the countries we are um, uh, that are part of the BTI that we see in the in the next edition. Uh, and finally, um, an overview of the governance index. Again, not as sobering as in as the political transformation dimension, but nonetheless, uh, every country except for South America, uh, South Africa, which had a positive turn when finally the uh, Zuma reign ended, and there was first first reforms taken uh, in. Uh, anti-corruption policies, but also to sort of restore the functioning of, of um, institutions and prioritizing um, the countries or set the country back to a course of, of uh, democratic governance. Two points I want to mention before I hand over to Ted. Uh, what is remarkable um, is that those factors that deteriorated the most in governance in all of the countries here is the inclusiveness of governing, um, meaning there is less um, consensus on where the country is and should be heading to by political actors. Um, the concepts of democracy based on the rule of law and market economy are more contested than they have been. There is less inclusion of civil society in the political process. And I think the most dramatic and, and probably impactful thing for the other dimensions, um, a lot of the more populist authoritarian leaning um, governing styles of, let's say, not only Erdogan, but, but probably also um, um, the governing styles of uh, Modi and um, and of course now Bolsonaro, um, are doing nothing to mediate societal conflicts, but they are using them and actually um, instrumentalizing them to their own um, ends, which in the long run will, of course, only uh, exacerbate the already existing uh, polarizations that we see in the countries. And this has also an effect on international relations, although most of the countries are still in a very are still very credible in international in the international community and do score pretty high in the regional cooperation area. We do also see a deterioration there, more volatile and less credible approach um, to international cooperation, regional cooperation. So I'll leave it at that and hand over to Ted. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sabina, for that introduction and your generous opening comments. Um, there's a lot of information there for our audience to chew on. Um, so uh, we'll dive right into um, the next segment of our program here. Um, thank you again to our speakers for coming together from all corners of the world um, and everyone else uh, in your different time zones. Um, I just want to say some opening words uh, about the geopolitical context now that we've looked at some of the governance trends going on at the national level. Um, about a decade ago, in the aftermath of the 2009 financial crisis, it became more evident that the world's leading democratic powers um, were really questioning the paths they were on. Um, they were faltering. Um, there were doubts about the neoliberal capitalist model, um, and leaders were looking for alternatives, um, whether on the left or on the right. And that included a reversion to more isolationist and nationalist positions um, on the international scene. Um, and that naturally led to doubts about the democracy's willingness 
and their ability to lead a continued investment in supporting transitions to democratic governance that were taking shape around the world. I mean, if you think about the trends that started back in the 80s and 90s, there that the Bertelsmann Transformation Index and others have been tracking for, for some time, um, we're in the midst of a historic wave of um, democratization that now um, has been in recession for about a decade. Um, so uh, this is catching up to us, so to speak. And if you look at these trends, one has to step back and think about, well, um, if the leading democracies post-Cold War are having their own doubts about the future of the international liberal order, uh, what about the um, middle power democracies? Um, these countries, um, diverse in their own right, um, who were struggling to leave behind you know, decades of autocratic, colonialist, military, or apartheid legacies, um, struggling to build their own democratic rule of law based societies um, and building a more inclusive economic development plan um, really had a different vision for their own future, very much coincident with the values and norms of uh, the democratic West or North, but wanting to strike their own path as well. So the question I was asking myself when I was at Brookings was um, could you document these trends and seeing if there was a convergence um, between uh, the paths of national political transformation and a foreign policy orientation that would perhaps um, reinforce uh, an international liberal order. Um, and I, you know, so I went back and looked at um, the progress that these five countries had made. Um, since their respective turning points toward democracy. And I, and I came away modestly hopeful that, with the exception of Turkey, um, which has gotten even worse from the time I wrote the book, um, that they had turned a corner toward uh, consolidation of uh, what we might call a liberal uh, democracy uh, model. Uh, I then went further and examined whether these five countries also become active members uh, regionally and or globally of this kind of diverse community of democracies that were willing to uh, support the international liberal order uh, as um, the original founders were going through their own stress tests. Um, and here, I found the evidence was much more mixed. Um, there were real divisions uh, of views on, for example, the use of force, um, with the Iraq war being the main dividing point, but also the conflict in, in Libya um, and the use of force there uh, was a real sticking point for, for many countries in this group of, of five. Um, Syria, of course, was another um, place where people just could not see eye to eye on, on how to handle these, these matters. Um, but those were kind of the most controversial. There was a lot of common ground on issues of how to deal, you know, we should work together to fight corruption. Um, we should cooperate on issues of uh, human rights at the UN. Um, we should work together on peacekeeping. Um, and other pillars of the international liberal order. So there was some good common ground. Women's rights, girls' rights was another area of uh, common ground. So some positive signs, some negative signs. That was five years ago. It's now 2020 and the world has changed dramatically. I would say for the worse. Um, certainly people will have different views. Um, so the goal today is to hear from our five experts uh, about what they think happened in their respective countries to disrupt these early, more, more positive trends. What I wanna do in the first round um, is pose the same set of questions to all five. And um, we're gonna start with Elizabeth from South Africa, then turn to Joseph to talk about Indonesia, 
Seda on Turkey, Oliver on Brazil, and Constantino on India. And, and the first set of questions, and I have five or six minutes each, um, how durable do you think the current trends of today um, in terms of democracy uh, and rule of law, how, how durable are these trends? Is this a, a, a pendulum situation? And, and what countervailing forces do you see in your countries um, to check these uh, negative trends and to reverse them? Um, and, and relatedly, are these trends having an impact on um, your country's foreign policies as it relates to uh, their willingness to contribute to this uh, international liberal, liberal order? Do you see a relationship between the negative domestic trends and the foreign policy ambitions uh, or lack thereof? Um, so why don't we start with Elizabeth? Right. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning, everybody. Um, here from a very, very cold um, Johannesburg. It's, it's great uh, to be with you and, and to be discussing a, a really very interesting topic. Um, of course, it's very good uh, to, to see the index uh, and to see that South Africa on a number of uh, indicators is actually either at the top or hasn't dropped as much as, as, as other countries. Um, and it's true to say that uh, certainly over the last couple of years, South Africa uh, has begun to turn the corner, although I would argue that in, in the context of your question, Tim, we still have a long way to go, and I think that corner is a very big one. Uh, and I don't think we, um, uh, we can say with any certainty that, uh, that this is going to be, a, a, that there will be a positive, um, a positive outcome necessarily. It's important to note that um, South Africa has been governed by a one, uh, by a, is a dominant uh, a one-party dominant uh, a democracy since 1994. So while we've had a number of changes in, 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 in presidents, uh, the, the governing party has remained the same since, uh, since 1994. And some of the issues and divisions and, and challenges that the governing party has been uh, fighting internally uh, about, I think, continue uh, 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 even, even in the post-Zuma era. Of course, the Zuma era, the 2009 to 2017, was the state capture decade. Uh, systemic political corruption uh, to advance private interests, uh, influencing states' decision-making processes on, on a whole range of things. Led from the highest echelons, we know that, of the state, and which saw the pillaging of state-owned enterprises, the appointment of officials and directors determined not by competence, but by the extent to which they were willing to buy into the state capture project the significant growth in the public sector, meteoric rise as a result in, in public debt, um, the ongoing challenges around poverty, inequality, and unemployment, which we haven't really um, tackled and which have become unfortunately much worse in this, in this COVID period. But at the start of 2018, when uh, we got a new president, President uh, Ramaphosa, there was, I think, a promise of political and societal renewal. And that certainly was the message that the, that the president conveyed and emphasized quite strongly the importance of the creation of an accountable state. So uh, take, uh, he took a number of, of, of important steps, including the appointment of a new national uh, director of public prosecutions, uh, providing uh, uh, resources, if not necessarily always adequate, to be able to take the, the state capture and corruption fight uh, uh, forward. Um, and a number of other, uh, I think, attempts to really strengthen, uh, strengthen the institutions, which had really been dealt a, a bad blow in the last, in the preceding 10 years. But the fact that he won the ANC presidency in December 2017 by a really very, very small margin um, meant that even within the party, uh, his victory was not necessarily an outright victory. There was still a significant number of, uh, of people, particularly also in the national uh, uh, economic um, National Executive Committee of the ANC that uh, were part of the state capture project and supporters of, of, of Zuma um, and continued, and these people continued to wield significant influence and power. And that meant that the president, uh, while certainly conveying very strong messages, uh, particularly on, on rolling back uh, corruption and uh, uh, transforming uh, the economy in a way that it could really take off. Um, again, uh, his, his ability to, to maneuver was um, significantly 
significantly constrained. These internal factional struggles within the ANC continue. It is the fight for the soul of the ANC and how they play themselves out, I think, probably in the, in the nearer rather than in the longer term, I think uh, will be key to answering that question that you posed, uh, uh, Ted, uh, in terms of whether this is uh, cyclical or, or, or much, more, much more durable. The, the COVID has cost the economy already an additional loss of 3 million jobs, most of them uh, women, um, it has uh, encouraged an illicit economy, uh, which we didn't need any encouragement on, fueled by the ban uh, on cigarettes and alcohol sales. Um, um, and, and the fact that this, ba this battle between lives and livelihoods continues um, with an economy that really can't continue uh, to be in, in, in lockdown, I think really poses significant uh, challenges for the, for the party, for the president. Um, in terms of, of populism, certainly, and in terms of governing styles, you cannot say that President Ramaphosa uh, is anything uh, um, uh, uh, um, as, as, say, a Bolsonaro or a Modi or, or an Erdogan. I think his, his style of leadership is very consensual, um, and I think it is about an attempt to build bridges and to build in, in, in institutions. Um, but the, the fact that there is this tension within the party and that there is also a, a breakaway from the ANC, the economic freedom fighters, which has also been, uh, I would say, a, dis, a destructive uh, uh, a factor in, 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 the body, in the body politic with a highly populist racist agenda, um, which has some, uh, uh, has some supporters, I think, even in the ANC, I think has made this a, a much more complicated situation. Um, let me just bring that to a to a close before I talk about countervailing forces. I mean, I think there are populist uh, uh, narratives uh, uh, within, uh, within the governing party. Um, uh, these are not necessarily, uh, um, the, well, uh, you know, when you talk about radical economic transformation and you link that to the destruction of white monop monopoly capital in a, in a, in a highly sort of uh, confrontational manner, that's probably not the kind of economic transformation uh, uh, you want, and there are segments uh, that advocate that. When you talk about land expropriation without compensation and not also recognize the importance of being able to provide a stable environment for investment, both internal and external, that also doesn't necessarily um, help the situation, notwithstanding the significant uh, issues, trans apartheid legacies that we do have to address around land, around jobs, around ownership of the economy and, and, and so on. And of course, underpinning all of this is the is, uh, are layers of racism, which have become, I think, increasingly uh, more acute uh, during the state capture years. In terms of countervailing forces, and I think this is also what the index highlights, apart from the message of renewal from the president, is that I think the state capture years have seen a significant uh, mobilization of countervailing forces. I think the judiciary and the constitutional court's reputation has been burnished by a number of judgments during that period. Um, uh, the same can be said really about uh, some really b brave, bold, investigative journalists who have done much to, to reveal uh, the, the extent of, of state capture, not, I must say, without uh, significant uh, threats to, 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 their, uh, to their safety and so on. Um, and civil society also during, uh, during the Zuma years, I think, really rallied towards the end uh, to, to, to really oppose it and, and, and to, fight, uh, to fight state capture. I think the one, the one uh, institution that's been missing is Parliament. Uh, it's not been able to really hold, hold the executive to the account over those, over those years, and that's partly a reflection of the way in which our electoral system works, where really they are... Um, they are accountable to the party more than more than they are accountable to to, to the citizens to the citizenry. But you've also had some cases, uh, particularly in the latter part of the the last few months of the Zuma years, where ANC bank benches, back benches actually did stand up and strongly interrogate many of the uh, state capture issues that had come before Parliament. Let me then finally just make a couple of observations around foreign, foreign policy. And I think here, ironically, well, I think there, there are two issues here. I think South Africa remains committed to multilateralism and to cooperation, to regional and, and continental cooperation. But I would say that the domestic troubles over the last several years have not seen a strategic presidential engagement on foreign policy of the kind we certainly saw under President Mbeki.
And I think this has come at a cost to the way in which we have positioned ourselves um, strategically in, 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 um, in both on the continent and in the world. I think this, there is an attempt now to turn this around. Um, I think one of the enduring narratives in South Africa's foreign policy has been to continue to advocate for the reform of the institutions of global governance. Uh, South Africa is really committed to that, but recognizes that things have to change. Um, that uh, the institutions as they currently are continue uh, to favor uh, uh, previous uh, power relations, whether we talk about these in political and security areas or we talk about these uh, in economic areas. And what I think is even more galling is the fact that uh, the, the powers that be continue to, uh, to in, a, in, in, in some ways, obstruct reforms that are on the table. And here, just looking at it from an economic perspective, the long time it took for the US uh, Congress to finally decide on uh, and sign off on the IMF quota reforms. Um, they were stuck in Congress for many years. On international human rights, I think um, um, th this new administration is really focused on South Africa needing to recapture the moral high ground that we lost and refocus towards human rights. And you've seen that uh, in, in, in some respects and in, in, in some of the, the ways in which it has consulted and, and engaged in the UN Security Council. Um, and to some extent in the Human Rights Council. But again, I mean, we, we've, we're in the process of producing a really interesting report on how African states have, uh, have voted in the, uh, in the UN Human Rights uh, Council in 2018. And I think what is really interesting to see is that South Africa on many of those has been really strongly supportive on women's rights. Um, it's, it's been considered uh, overall to be really in sort of in the overall political sort of rights uh, framework to be uh, 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 unwilling to defend uh, in terms of the categories we've created um, and in uh, on issues of civil and political rights uh, has been a little lukewarm and it's not been a strident supporter and the same goes for uh, issues of political freedoms insofar as they've been brought uh, to the um, uh, to the Human Rights uh, Council. I'm happy to take additional questions on that, but one last point on COVID. I think uh, COVID uh, has uh, highlighted uh, South Africa's, uh, the emphasis that South Africa places on uh, continental cooperation. It's the chair of the uh, African Union at the moment, and I think played a significant role in mobilizing cooperation and coordination on COVID right up from, from February onwards. Um, um, also in, in the context of the G20 uh, and mobilizing a common procurement platform for medicine and medical supplies for emergency fund envoys around debt relief and so on. And really has also been very supportive of the World um, uh, Health Organization. Last point is that unlike some of the other countries in, in this mix, I think uh, South Africa under President Ramaphosa has certainly seen the value of engaging with the scientific community and taking decisions linked to science uh, on, this, uh, on this issue. Great, Elizabeth, that's really helpful, comprehensive, hit all the key points, thank you for that. Let me quickly turn now to Joseph, give us a sense of how Indonesia is doing. Uh, thanks, Ted. Uh, let me just share some thoughts uh, on Indonesia. The first thing I'll say is that I think uh, structurally there are uh, things to, to cheer about uh, in the case of, of Indonesia. Um, I don't have time to rehash the, the history of democratization, but um, what is important to, for us to take note is that um, just last year, uh, April 2019, uh, Indonesia held its fifth democratic election, it elected, uh, it re-elected uh, Joko Widodo, which is uh, significant because he's the first civilian to be re-elected uh, in, in Indonesia. Um, and he was, uh, when he was first elected, he was a political outsider, right? I think everyone knew, or most people know about his, his story and how he, he came out uh, through a system that um, hitherto was very much uh, in favor of uh, uh, it was a very oligarchic system, uh, favoring entrenched interests. And then this, this guy comes up from, from nowhere. Um, and uh, it was kudos to the decentralization policy that was introduced in 2000, 2001, um, that facilitated the rise to power of someone like uh, a regional uh, politician, uh, someone like uh, Joko uh, Widodo. Um, and uh, we also see in Indonesia increasingly uh, a more, uh, I'll, I'll call it a more sophisticated uh, electorate in terms of 
voting patterns for the legislature and the, the presidency. Um, um, uh, the, uh, uh, Indonesians vote uh, the strongest candidate for, for the pres at the presidential election, but they retain party loyalties for, for the, the legislative election. And as a result of that, you see in Indonesia uh, a great diversity of political parties. Um, the, the party that polled the highest vote at the last election, uh, the PDIP, uh, basically only polled 19% uh, of, the, of the popular vote. Um, so from this perspective, it appears that uh, party discipline uh, does hold more so than, than personality or patronage uh, politics. So this should make for a more stable democracy, um, but as I will touch in a, in a bit, um, it's not quite the case, uh, and as the as uh, Sabina's uh, presentation showed, the statistics uh, appear to be trending downwards. But uh, just to round off the, the the things to cheer about in Indonesia, um, the free press, uh, a very active civil society, maybe a bit too active, too vocal, some people might say, but um, that is uh, that is um, um, to to the to the to the benefit uh, to. Uh, to the benefit of Indonesian uh, society, obviously. But I will point out three challenges that have surfaced um, from the time uh, Ted published his book to, uh, I suppose, today. Um, three challenges uh, to Indonesian uh, democracy. The first is that we see a pushback from, the, from entrenched interests from the political establishment. I think the most uh, profound example of this was how um, uh, in September last year, just a few days before the end of the, the parliamentary term, um, Parliament passed several very controversial bills that really um, got uh, students and civil society uh, activists all riled up and out in the streets. Um, these bills had to do with um, a revision of the Corruption Eradication Commission law um, that basically just made it more difficult for the Commission to operate um, it had to do with um, the introduction of a penal code um, that discriminates against minorities, that um, uh, legislates uh, against uh, communism, treason, insulting the head of state and government uh, ministers, uh, etc. And of course, these were deliberately left vague and open to inter interpretation, you know, what constitutes an insult. Um, so, uh, but really it was the, the weakening of the, the anti-graph body that uh, was, uh, uh, you know, quite damaging, I think, um, to, to the democratization process. Um, that's number one. Second, um, the co-optation of the opposition by um, Joko Widodo. Um, when he won the election, he surprised many by co-opting his, uh, his opponent, right, uh, Prabowo Subianto, the former son-in-law of um, Suharto, um, and made him the defense minister. And uh, as the United States knows only too well, um, uh, Prabowo has a, I'll, let's call it a checkered human rights uh, record, right, uh, uh, during his time as a commander when he uh, when it was alleged that um, he was uh, involved in human rights abuses during the anti Suharto protests in 1998. So this guy is now the defense minister in the, in the government. Um, he's, uh, I, I, I don't know whether the U.S. has lifted the ban on uh, uh, Prabowo, War, but um, he, as, of, uh, 20, as of the election, he was banned from entering uh, the U.S., I believe. Um, so, so this speaks to the larger trend of accommodating vested interests into uh, the government. And this is something that um, I think uh, has been a bit of a disappointment when people think about Jacobi and the, and the hopes that he had uh, brought for, um, um, for Indonesia to break out of this hole of uh, vested interests. But instead, what happens now is that losers become winners uh, in, in, his, in his government. Um, so ostensibly, it's like a unity government of sorts, but there's, there, there are dynamics uh, beneath that. So that's the second thing. Uh, and uh, the third thing is um, the rise of religious conservatism. Um, 
that is being mobilized by political opportunists um, in Indonesia. Um, essentially, what I'm talking about is the emergence of what we call um, identity politics. Um, this was illustrated in the <coughs> excuse me in the the smear campaign against um, the during the the Jakarta uh, elections for for governor a couple of years ago, um, and um, what you have is a situation where these conservative religious forces are so powerful, so influential. Um, you either um, you either cultivate them. You either cultivate them or you, you, you hope that they are not targeted uh, at you, right? And this is precisely what uh, Joko Widodo did, right? He basically, against his uh, preference, he had to choose a, a conservative religious leader as his vice presidential uh, candidate in order to, to harness, uh, uh, if, if not neutralize, certainly to harness that base uh, for his electoral uh, campaign. So, and it's important to take note, I think, that um, a lot of this rise of religious conservatism was a phenomenon that was actually unleashed um, by, to some extent, by democratization and political uh, liberalization. You know, if the, if the institutions are not uh, opening up fast enough to be able to manage these uh, tensions that, that, um, that come out as the underbelly, if I may, uh, of democratization. This is the kind of problems uh, you have. Let me move very quickly to a couple of minutes on foreign policy. Um, simply put, um, this Indonesian government has given very little priority to foreign, poli to foreign policy, whether, so this is the second term, right? So whether it's the first term or the second term. Um, when um, Joko Widodo was uh, first elected into office, he un he un he un, un what, what do you call that? He he rolled out this um, uh, global maritime fulcrum, right? He wanted to position um, Indonesia as the the hub and the center between uh, the the Indian Ocean, uh, the Pacific Ocean, South China Sea, etc. Um, all you have to do is go and uh, ask around about this global maritime fulcrum today. Uh, five years after it was uh, announced, and you will get a pretty good sense of <laughs> where where it stands. Um, in fact, it's been it's been basically overwhelmed by the uh, you know call it the free open Indo Pacific or whatever model of the Indo Pacific, depending on whether you're in Tokyo, uh, New Delhi, Canberra, or Washington, right? Um, so all those conceptions have surpassed the signature initiative. Uh, what was supposed to be the signature initiative of this. Uh, Indonesian uh, government by way of foreign policy. Um, and the last point I will raise with regards to um, issues of um, uh, human rights, um, a very interesting thing to bear in mind, um, how did Indonesia respond at the height of the Rohingya crisis uh, in, in Myanmar? Um, Indonesia um, protested in a very sort of... Uh, uh, run of the mill uh, diplomatic uh, way, but um, people who are looking for Indonesia to take a lead, um, marshalling uh, support uh, for the plight of the Rohingya, um, the, the the religious co uh, uh, co affinity um, uh, uh, dynamic, uh, didn't materialize. It didn't materialize. Um, of course, um, there there are other dynamics involved with regards to ASEAN and non-interference and all that sort of stuff. But um, it was, uh, I think it was quite surprising how uh, muted uh, Indonesia's response was. But you, you can't blame Indonesia. I look at the rest of the Muslim world. <laughs> very few people were, 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 were very actively uh, condemning that. And, and let alone Xinjiang. Okay? Xinjiang, everyone was silent uh, on Xinjiang. Yeah, so, so I'll, I'll stop there. Right. <laughs> now, so the, the bottom line on the foreign policy side sounds like it's missing in action, Indonesia, um, and that maybe the prior administration before Jokowi was really the exception to the rule. Um, and that um, is my kind of takeaway. Um, let's turn to Turkey, uh, Seda, which is uh, probably the hardest case of these five um, for your comments.
Thank you. Before before I start, let me say that it's a pleasure being part of this uh, this event, this roundtable. Uh, indeed, Turkey is a very interesting case to study. As uh, Sabina's uh, slides uh, showed earlier uh, in the introduction, it's a, it's an extreme case of autocratization, uh, Turkey. Uh, in a very short period of time, uh, things went really bad in, in, in Turkey. Um, and uh, in my brief introduction in uh, intervention, I will try to summarize uh, this complex uh, autocratization process in Turkey and its foreign policy repercussions. Um, in domestic uh, politics in Turkey, uh, I, I, I can summarize what ha what's happening in Turkey under maybe four uh, headings uh, that constitute the main patterns in Turkey's autocratization uh, process. We observed these four patterns patterns since 2011, uh, but uh, these uh, these patterns have become more pronounced since 2016 uh, failed uh, coup in Turkey. First of all, what we observe is Turkey is, is a rising nationalist tide. Uh, this nationalism is, is a conservative and sectarian type of nationalism. It's not only among uh, the ruling elite, but also uh, among the uh, opposition parties. And the current system, current presidential system, uh, is based on uh, AKP's ruling, so Tayyip Erdogan's uh, party, AKP's ruling, with an extreme right uh, party, MHP, uh, to form an electoral uh, alliance and uh, in order to be able to pass laws uh, from parliament, uh, the, uh, this alliance is, uh, is likely to continue. Uh, but it's not only among the ruling elite, as I said, opposition parties as well are, are highly uh, national uh, in Turkey. The second characteristic uh, in, in, in uh, Turkey is a deep polarization. Uh, in Turkey, there were always several fault lines, but since 2016, uh, the uh, country is divided into two um, opposing camps. Uh, polarization is visible not only uh, politically, so among political parties, but also uh, within the society. Uh, there are diverging camps, uh, diverging preferences uh, in society, and uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan continuously adopt uh, um, a polarizing rhetoric, uh, and he, he bases his rule on a non-inclusive majoritarian type of uh, governance model. Uh, the third trend in Turkish domestic politics is, uh, as we all know, a uh, rising authoritarian trend. Uh, and uh, this authoritarian uh, trend has turned, has actually accelerated since uh, 2016. Uh, as of 2018, Freedom House uh, uh, would classify Turkey as partly free. Uh, now it's a non-free uh, country. And uh, BTI uh, has classified uh, Turkey as, uh, as a moderate uh, uh, autocracy. And fourth and last characteristics or domestic trend in Turkey uh, is the growing Islamization attempt by the ruling elite. But this Islamization actually is as a top-down uh, process. It does not come uh, from the society, but it is uh, constantly injected by, uh, the, uh, by the ruling elite and, and the government. And the last incident probably all followed. Uh, it was uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan's decision uh, to convert uh, Hagia Sophia uh, last week into a mosque. Um, obviously, these uh, domestic trends in Turkey have rep repercussions uh, in, in foreign policy. Um, and here as well, I will mention four characteristics. Uh, first of all, uh, there is a move back to traditional Westphalian type of foreign policy. Uh, Turkey is more prone to conflict. It's uh, less cooperative. Unilateralism instead of multilateralism uh, is, is a very dominant characteristic of Turkish foreign policy. And we have recent examples uh, like in the Eastern Mediterranean drilling activities by Turkey or Turkey's military presence uh, in, in uh, Libya, its incursion in uh, North Syria. Uh, and international reaction is not a, a, not a source of concern uh, to, to these uh, unilateral acts uh, by Turkey, 
but on the contrary, they are continuously consumed in domestic politics. Um, and uh, uh, well, AKP uh, and, uh, and Recep Tayyip Erdogan launched uh, the uh, precious loneliness uh, doctrine uh, for Turkey, uh, emphasizing that Turkey is constantly uh, 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 fighting against enemies uh, and domestic collaborators of, of uh, these uh, external enemies. And uh, uh, Turkey is uh, currently having uh, problems in, inter in the international arena with Israel, uh, Egypt, Gulf countries, with the exception of Qatar, maybe. Uh, relations with the EU is, is very problematic. US is another uh, source of concern. So um, relations also with international organizations are difficult. Um, second characteristic of Turkish policy is that Turkey uh, is more assertive and it follows a balancing strategy in foreign policy to further not only Turkish interests but also to consolidate executive uh, power. Um, Turkey, without consulting its allies, um, can build new, and these are usually very flexible alliances, uh, short-term interest based on short-term interest and pragmatic, uh, pragmatic um, interests uh, of, of the government. Uh, and recent examples we have seen, for example, Turkey's alliance with Russia in, in Syria uh, and uh, shifting alliances uh, in Libya. Um, and the third characteristic of Turkish foreign policy is that Turkey can easily resort to the use of force to solve its problems, which was not the case during the Republican uh, uh, era. But now uh, we can uh, easily uh, uh, predict that Turkey, in, a, in order to solve its problems, will resort to the use of force instead of uh, um, international uh, forums. And its uh, growth armament industry actually uh, facilitates uh, this, uh, this uh, trend. And the last um, issue that I want to mention uh, before uh, closing foreign policy trends uh, in Turkey is that the in external context and in internal context um, has become uh, fused in Turkey. So the line between external politics, international relations, and domestic politics have become uh, very thin, and uh, external context, uh, international relations, or developments in international relations are um, instrumentalized for Erdogan's uh, domestic uh, purposes. Um, Going back to Ted's question, whether all these trends in domestic politics and foreign policy, are they endurable or uh, uh, conjectural? Um, I think that what we observe in Turkey, uh, it's not a peculiar incident. It's not a, it's not a cause, uh, actually. It's more a consequence. Uh, it's, it's part of the broader crisis of democracy and uh, liberal world order, and several scholars, and there is a huge literature on this, uh, pointing to uh, this uh, crisis of uh, liberal democracy. Um, and uh, I, will, I will mention a couple of, uh, a couple of scholars, for Seda, example, Yim Manor. Yes. Seda, if I, if, I, if I may jump in here, because I do want to make sure we have time to do the Q&A for our audience and we still have two more speakers. So I'm gonna ask you to pause here um, and see if we have time to address your next set of uh, points in the next round. Um, and thank you for those comments though. It seems to me that our title for this program is Five Falling Stars. It sounds like Turkey has already fallen. Um, I think next on the program is Oliver um, on Brazil. Uh, Oliver, welcome. Thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to be part of this. It's uh, to discuss with uh, old friends, uh, several of whom I haven't seen in quite a while. And I think the fact that I, I haven't seen them in, in a while is proof that the entire, you know, the ties in the global south have, uh, you know, uh, weakened somewhat. Uh, I think Bolsonaro's rise has, um, um, you know, has weakened also, you know, initiatives such as BRICS. Uh, and I think that's been reflected in, in joint initiatives by, uh, amongst those uh, five countries that we're discussing here. And I, um, so I'm, I'm very happy to, 
that you uh, uh, led this initiative to think comparatively, uh, comparatively about the five countries in question. My sense is that uh, we're looking really at two uh, categories here uh, because I um, kind of felt, you know, when Elizabeth was, was talking about South Africa and Joseph about Indonesia, I was like, ah, oh, come on, you know, this isn't really too bad. Uh, and, and when I heard Seda, I was like, you know, this kind of like, looks like what Brazil may be a year or two from now. I don't know, um, so Tina is, is, is behind me, so I, I don't know where India stands. But, um, but what really I think is the case about Brazil is that compared to, uh, and even Erdogan, you know, uh, Seda said, you know, how quickly this all happened. And I, I was like, well, he's been in power for really a long time in, in Brazil by comparison. Uh, we're now one and a half years into the Bolsonaro government. Uh, uh, somebody who was elected on an openly anti-democratic platform, I think very different than, than Turkey. I can remember a time when uh, the West was fairly uh, positive and, and optimistic about, uh, uh, about Erdogan. So uh, I, I think the big difference in Brazil is it's much, much faster. Uh, there's been no attempt to veil um, authoritarian antics at all. Uh, and, you know, uh, uh, he was elected for many reasons. Uh, he was like a big white piece of cloth and everybody was just, you know, projecting things onto the president on, uh, when he was a candidate. He was uh, certainly brilliant from an electoral point of view in 2018 because he identified uh, three uh, major concerns amongst Brazil's electorate, which was a, f a big uh, frustration from the economic point of view. Um, so he w wanted to, you know, be somebody who would you know, turn the economy around, um, big concern about public insecurity. Despite Brazil's rise over the past 20 years, we've never been able to control our public secu uh, security crisis. Uh, and, you know, even when you know, Brazil grew 7% a year, we had massive increases in homicides, um, which stood last year at uh, nearly 60,000, which makes uh, Brazil uh, more dangerous or has many, many more homicides than, you know, ins insurgency Iraq and Afghanistan together. Uh, so, so he was able to, to use that dynamic. Uh, and I think a sense of, you know, massive corruption, moral decay, which is an interesting point because on the path towards consolidating democracy, you'll always have moments in which some um, structures of democracy consolidate quicker than others. And, uh, you, know, uh, you know, if once the media and, and uh, corruption oversight bodies start working and the elites don't really uh, follow up as much, you, you have suddenly a sense uh, amongst the, uh, the population that democracy is actually getting much worse which may not necessarily be the case because uh, we didn't really have those oversight bodies in back in the 90s when you may have had as much corruption, but uh, not necessarily the knowledge about it. Um, the other thing I, I wanted to say is that uh, in, in, in Brazil, I think we, this, the rise of Bolsonaro, which is also to some extent a symptom and not a cause, uh, exposed a lot of underlying, continued underlying anti-democratic elements in Brazilian society. There's, there's genuine concern among governors today whether they are able to, uh, they're protected against potential mutinies um, of uh, the military police, for example, which is steeped into sort of Bolsonaro, uh, you know, Bolsonaro's thoughts. There's a lot of doubts about uh, to how committed the armed forces are to protect um, the, the constitution against a president who avows to, to violate it. Uh, and he, Bolsonaro has in that sense used sort of a, a, a Chavez type strategy of bringing in a lot of uh, generals into the administration. And so the, 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 the generals are a bit like, well, you know, um, we don't want to be associated with this uh, but at the same time, we're also so deep into this that we now need to move even further into the government to fix it. So uh, I think Bolsonaro is, is a bit like the Brazilian Armed Forces Vietnam, where you're kind of stuck between, I want to get out of here, but I'm so associated to this that if this government train wrecks, then it will all, always also um, affect my reputation.
the kind of the, the question of whether this is cyclical or not will depend on the uh, capacity of uh, pro-democratic forces in Brazil to protect uh, the constitution from this very obvious and very uh, transparent almost um, attack on Brazilian democracy. There's really no uh, secret about this, and this makes it all, you know very different, I think, from uh, the other cases. It's not that you know Bolsonaro says, "Oh, I'm a Democrat," and he's un under the table, you know, uh, moving towards weakening democracy. He's saying, you know, that uh, there were a lot of things that were better under the military dictatorship, and democracy has failed us in a, in a way. Uh, so it's at least it's there's no ambiguity here, right? That's uh, that's almost an advantage. Uh, and uh, newspapers, the Supreme Court, Congress, academia, civil society have been sort of shaken and saying, yeah, this is your moment. Uh, if, if you want to, you know, if you want to do something to protect democracy, it's now and you have to do it out, the, out in the open. And I think the question is now, it's sort of who will, um, who will prevail in that. And I think that will depend a lot on uh, whether Bolsonaro will be lucky enough to ride on sort of some kind of commodity wave or, or boost economic growth. Unfortunately, uh, I would say we're kind of in that situation where if we, if Brazil grew seven to eight percent right now, like Chavez was able to, you know, manage in Venezuela, then I think Brazilian democracy would probably not survive. I think paradoxically, the economic crisis right now in him is very evident incapacity to manage the COVID-19 crisis make Brazilian democracy more likely to survive. Foreign policy, I think I don't need to say, Brazil has become uh, the world's leading anti-multilateral, anti-science, anti-human rights force uh, in the West. Um, not really any potential to, to work with uh, the federal government. A lot of potential to work with civil society, uh, state governments, and mayors. Um, so that's the, um, the situation. I think there's no beating around the bush. Uh, I think Brazil continues to be um, a country with tremendous uh, potential. I think it continues to be a country of the future. That future may be a bit more distant, uh, but that's where we are. Thank you. Wow. I mean, that's really stunning. Um, so we should expect to see further declines on all these graphs and charts that we started the program with. Um, and thank you for that, Oliver, for being so concise and wrapping all that up. Um, we're going to turn to Tino. I want to remind the audience that we have um, an opportunity for Q&A. Please add your questions and direct them to a speaker in the Q&A box. And we'll turn to you immediately after Tino finishes. Um, and uh, in, in light of our compressed time here, um, the world's largest democracy. Um, Tino, tell us how it's going. Well, thanks, Ted. Uh, I'll see what I can do with 1.4 billion people uh, in a pretty resilient democracy, especially after these uh, quite gloomy comments from, uh, from uh, Brazil uh, and from some other countries. I think uh, things don't look as bad here, if I may risk saying that. And Ted, I'm, your book is really wonderful. I was reading it again uh, today, 2016. I know you were working on it before, but in fact, rereading it today, I sense that this was not really a, a defense of these five democracies. There are a lot of hints in your chapters at what really came true and what we're seeing now, these challenges, uh, these internal uh, obstacles in these countries that are really tying them down and not allowing them to be more activist, a word used a lot in your, in your analysis of these countries on their foreign policy, et cetera. So they've become more introverted, uh, a more uh, um, passive in many ways, more cynic in their foreign policy, no doubt about that. But despite that, you know, I would not concur with calling India a falling star. Um, you may call it, um, you know, something between, I would say, continuously still rising star and maybe on a certain limbo and a certain plateau. But I'll try to explain why. And I think one way to do this is what Joseph was saying about the resilience of institutions and the capacity of institutions to respond to populism and to the representative dimension in democracy. So if you're gonna look at the basic, say, liberal deliberative space of Indian democracy, and if you look at the indexes, uh, the both of one, the bo both you discussed today and many others, I was looking at how India has been ranking in these various indexes. So, I mean, you can look at uh, rule of law, the media, Freedom House, um, justice, judicial sort of capacity, 
minorities, religion, on all of these, India has been you know, plateauing or even falling on the index slightly, but it's still better than the average. That's number one. Um, and there's certainly crises on all of these issues in this country, right? You have a strong populist drive leading Prime Minister Modi to power. You have uh, hints and indications of uh, um, trying to revise or even reconstitute institutions. Uh, you have hints, of course, of a whole religious agenda that is not the first in Indian politics, but has come out in the open more obviously. So if you look at the basic liberal, deliberative, you know, capacity of Indian democracy, there are signs of warning and concerns. But let's look at it from the other side in terms of the basic representative capacity of Indian democracy. And what's happened over the last few years is really extraordinary. Look at the last elections. India in 17 elections, um, last election record turnout of around, I think, 67%. So you have 1.4 billion people, uh, of which two and three voters are showing up for a re-election of Prime Minister Modi. So that's on just participation. I mean, phenomenal if you look at other democracies and other developing democracies, in fact. Look at gender. For the first time in 70 years, uh, voter participation among women equaled men. For the first time in 70 years, as the participation rate among women uh, finally reached parity with men. Look at age. 84 million voters, um, uh, first-time voters registered in the last election, a record again. So a whole new bubble of young people wanting to participate in the political process called democracy and in the voting process, but also in the constant media processes through social media, protests on the streets. We have really a vibrancy of young people across uh, younger age groups. Um, first time contenders uh, in terms of the election, second highest in 40 years. So you have a lot of new politicians running for office for the first time uh, in the history of this democracy. Finally, two important criteria too, class and caste in India. Class, you had a higher voter turnout in the rural, poorer constituency than the urban constituencies. Again, something fascinating, quite extraordinary in these developing countries, but it's actually the poorer people in the rural countryside of India that are showing up more to vote by five percentage point higher actually than the urban voters. And finally, caste. Uh, you look at you know, a clear correlation between the lower you go down in the caste system, down to the Dalits, the so-called untouchables in the past, the higher the voter participation, including a record turnout of the scheduled tribes, uh, which are the sort of outcasts from the tribal communities in India known as Adivasis, which had a participation rate, a record one of 75%. It used to be 20, 30, 40% in previous decades. So just to give you these two, I think these, this puzzle, I think the system is under stress domestically, but that's not necessarily bad news. This can either deepen or derail democracy. And I think we constantly have to keep this in, in mind when we look, especially these big non-Western democracies that are going through radical social and economic revolutions. India only opened up its economy 20 to 30 years ago. So you have a mass consumerist class joining the political process. You have a new private media showing up that didn't exist pre-90s. So you have a whole real revolution, I'd say, of which Prime Minister Modi and populism and certain authoritarian accents have been more of a symptom rather than the cause, I think, of these various concerns uh, I just laid out. Coming to foreign policy, Ted, how does this reflect? I mean, hearing the other speakers, actually, again, I'm becoming even more optimistic. You had Prime Minister Modi showing up at World War I and World War II cemeteries for the first time, a Prime Minister of India saying, these two world wars were a battle for the values of democracy, freedom, uh, uh, which were won by the West, but we actually participated in. And many Indians, as you know, hundreds of thousands of Indians laid their lives down in, the, in the, what used to be an imperial war by the British colonialists, but now has become really the fight for freedom. That's a very new narrative. You see the alliance of multilateralism, a Franco-German initiative, where India has actually joined quite enthusiastically, unlike Brazil, for example, but showing up and saying, you know, this is an important moment to reinvigorate international institutions. And it's not difficult to guess why, coming to my third aspect. China showing up with a very different model of governance, a different model of aid and economic assistance, including in India's neighborhood, uh, a tremendous financial power that Chinese have in developing the Belt and Road Initiative, and here you suddenly have India speaking about liberal connectivity, rule of law, 
transparency, accountability infrastructure project. It's a very liberal language coming out of India's foreign policy. So the, the, the instincts of India in many ways are coming out thanks to China showing up as a strategic arrival. And finally, look at the COVID crisis. Um, the Community of Democracies, Warsaw Declaration of 2000, 20th anniversary this year, just had a meeting, a virtual meeting. The Deputy Indian Foreign Minister showed up. And I mean, you just look at the speech, I invite you to look at it. It is a speech about the importance of democracy, the role India assumes in supporting other democracies and the advantages of democracy in responding to this COVID crisis in, in its various dimensions, the health dimension, the public policy deliverables, the governance uh, uh, challenges, uh, in many ways also the economic challenges. So I see on the foreign policy front actually a continuous instinct of India to speak more about democracy, sometimes cynically. I mean, all democracies do it. The US has done it, you know, Ted and Brazil and all countries have their, their skeletons in, in, in their, their closets uh, uh, um, in terms of promoting a principled foreign policy. But certainly I see um, a greater interest in, in looking at democracy as a foreign policy asset. In particular, last example on data governance, for example. You mentioned the EU-India summit yesterday. The European Union and India are now actively talking to each other about privacy on data governance and digital connectivity. Now, nobody in the Indian government is talking to Russia or China on data privacy or any type of regulation or legislation on this sort of new data revolution. And that shows you again the instinct that India has domestically transpiring in its foreign policy. Great, that was a wonderful overview and optimistic one. Thank you, Tino. Um, I see that our Q&A uh, list is growing and I also see the clock ticking and we've um, obviously tried to compress a lot into a short period of time. So I hope people will um, indulge us and maybe go five minutes over time. And I also suggest Tony perhaps um, that we try to consolidate the questions as much as possible um, so that maybe there are you know two or three that can be grouped together um, and and ask the panelists to be very brief as much as possible in their in their reply so we can go through this as quickly as possible so i'm going to turn um the the baton over to tony for uh the q a portion and thank our um, speakers very much again Thanks, Ted. Yeah, you're right. We've got some really complex questions with no simple answers, but I know our speakers will do their best to try to give us uh, a brief response, at least to get a flavor of, uh, of some of these issues. Um, I'm going to try to combine these into a couple of thematic buckets and then parse them out to, uh, to folks to answer uh, as we go. The first question I wanted to touch on is a question around uh, U.S. and Chinese influence in your respective countries. And maybe, Elizabeth, I'm going to come back to you to start and Tino, I'm gonna to give you a shot at this as well. Um, if you could talk just very briefly about some of the, the influences, positive, negative, and otherwise, around US and China in South Africa, beginning with you, Elizabeth. Very, very quickly, um, thanks, Tony. I think China is, is regarded as a very important uh, partner for South Africa. Um, it is certainly seen in the, in, in the broader sort of uh, as an important partner in the global south, a developing country and all of those, uh, those good things. Um, I think um, paradoxically, it, South Africa has also, although I don't think it actually needed to take such a, such a position a few months ago, sort of quite clearly stated that when it comes to issues of, of Huawei and um, and rolling out infrastructure that South Africa and Africa uh, need, that uh, South Africa is is clearly in 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 China's in China's corner. From a from a trade perspective, of course, China is the single largest uh, trading partner uh, of South Africa at this point. If you if you consider the EU separately, uh, its component parts. I think the relationship with the having said that, though, um, I think it's also the case that particularly when you look at how South Africa engages in multilateral institutions, notwithstanding the perception that uh, it always votes with China and with Russia, um, I think the um, uh, the, the sort of situation on the ground is probably a little bit more nuanced and certainly in, in, in the UN Security Council that South Africa has sat on in the last uh, two years. I think there have been cases where South Africa has actually 
uh, set a, an independent uh, a course on, on a number of, of issues, specific, specifically around, um, uh, around items uh, on, on African conflicts on the Security Council um, agenda. In, uh, the US and South Africa will, have always had a, an ambiguous, shall we say, relationship. Um, I think, uh, uh, you know, the ANC in particular enjoys uh, talking about, you know, the American imperialists, uh, and that um, uh, features regularly in the ANC documents in that, in, in that regard. But it's been an ambiguous relationship because I think it's an important trading partner. I think on, on some issues historically, um, uh, we have worked well together. And even under this Trump administration, which has been, I think, a very difficult one, I think for all of us. Um, I think it hasn't precluded South Africa, again, if we're looking at multilateral uh, institutions, from working and, uh, constructively with the US, for example, on some of the initiatives at the Security Council around South Sudan. So I think South Africa takes a very pragmatic approach uh, to that. Um, I, I think China is certainly uh, on the rise and I think is seen as a very important uh, partner for South Africa. And South Africa certainly avoids taking issue with China on many of the issues that uh, are, are, are human rights issues, which would be highly uh, uh, controversial and con uh, contentious, uh, when you, whether you're thinking of the South China Sea or the Uyghurs in, uh, in West, uh, West China. Thanks for that, Elizabeth. Tino, I want to turn to you. Obviously, it's, it's been a particularly uh, challenging month for, for India-Chinese relations, but India is always in a position where it has to thread the needle in its relationships with China and with the United States. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, Tony, I think, um, I mean, we can have our preferences, our assessments, but these are really two of the greatest political experiments we've seen in a long time in this modern political age, India and China, right? You have two different models of development, one centralized, single party, the other one decentralized, a multiplicity of diverse political interests. I mean, a fabulous democracy in many ways. And uh, we'll see what happens. But for the time being, no doubt that China has had uh, an advantage. Uh, the asymmetry with India on GDP per capita, military capabilities, as we've seen last, in recent weeks, is rising and is creating a lot of pressure on India. Now, the problem is the United States, which was shepherding in many ways this liberal order Ted described so well in his, in his book, is missing in action. And this is exactly after 10 to 15 years where the US and India revolutionized their relations became very close. India in many ways took the US for granted and said the US will deal with all the nasty stuff we don't like to do and we will just stay below the radar, keep good relations with the Russians and the Chinese and keep very non-aligned, etc. That's no longer tenable now. The US again disappeared off the radar. It's become very unreliable for India. China's become an increasingly threatening presence uh, in its capacity, in its military, in its, in its aggressive territorial expansion. We saw it in the South China Sea. We see it again now in South Asia in the recent weeks. So that leaves India with only one option. I think we've seen now play out over the last three, four years consistently, which is creating some type of a middle power architecture of other countries that are equally concerned about this you know, declining US and more aggressive China to try to create some incentives for the Chinese to play ball in a very decent way and follow some rules. Now, this is very difficult, but if you look at the partners India has looked at and has been engaging, they all happen to be, most of them, the most exciting developments in the foreign policy front have been with democracies. Japan, the best bilateral relationship India has had over the last few years, Australia and the European Union, including France, Germany, and the UK. Um, and a variety of other countries, of course, Russia is a difficult relationship. It's mostly a military relationship remains there. One thing that is missing, and I think Oliver will remember from the more exciting 2000s, was the India, Brazil, South Africa, South-South developmental democratic axis. That was one India felt particularly comfortable with, which unfortunately, I think, because of developments in Brazil in particular, uh, in South Africa, maybe slightly, maybe also in India, but has has fallen off the radar. But that holds promise, and I think needs to be reactivated because that's really the type of democracy that India identifies most with. Thanks, Tino. I'm I'm doing a little bit of rhetorical gymnastics here to try to get as many questions as possible in, and I want to turn to to Seta. Um, I'll also ask for Oliver and Joseph to chime in on this one. Um, and this combines several questions that have, that have come up in the Q&A box. And that's about the strength of institutions. 
um, and whether the institutions in your respective countries um, can either consolidate positive trends toward democracy or reverse anti-democratic trends. Seda, why don't I start with you on that? Thank you very much. Um, well, in Turkey, uh, I think in the, at least in the short period, in the short uh, run, it would be very difficult to reverse the autocratization process uh, because um, there is no better player. Uh, media, civil society is fully controlled uh, by the executive judiciary. Key appointments in high courts, again, are highly uh, uh, fully controlled by uh, the palace itself, by Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Um, main opposition parties are uh, marginalized uh, and uh, parliamentary oversight of the president is, is limited. Um, for Kurdish party HDPs, uh, co-chair uh, is in jail. Um, elections might be the only way to change uh, the current government. Uh, it's the only way uh, citizens express, still express their opposition to the government. Uh, Op uh, elections are currently free, but uh, it is accepted that they are uh, largely unfair. Um, so for the short term and uh, medi medium term, there are no um, uh, strengths or controlling forces in Turkey uh, to stop uh, or reverse uh, the, 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 the autocratization uh, trend in Turkey. Uh, but I think the corona crisis crisis and in the aftermath of the corona crisis probably especially turkey is going to have uh, a serious economic crisis uh, this might uh, compel the government to readopt or revise its governance model and uh, the durability of AKP's or Tayyip Erdogan's uh, uh, government will very much depend on the resilience of uh, his governance model uh, in the face of very complex problems that uh, uh, Turkey uh, is very likely to face in the coming months and years. Thanks, Sada. Oliver, as I turn to you, I might just throw in another element to this, if you don't mind maybe commenting on that. And that's a question about uh, whether there, there are any additional guardrails provided at the state level uh, in Brazil, uh, or if not, where, is the, where are the institutional guardrails coming from? Thank you. All right. So, um... I think, uh, like in Turkey, the elections are, are really crucial. And then it's, it's really a question, as I said, of um, how quickly uh, the president uh, will lose elections or whether he has time to use a moment of good economic times to do something that somewhat similar as has happened in, in Venezuela or Turkey. I mean, Turkey has seen pretty good economic growth in the early years of Erdogan. Uh, or in, in other countries like Hungary that, where we've seen that uh, democracy decline in, in economically good times. Um, but I, 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 I don't think that uh, uh, Brazil's institutions will emerge stronger from this, but I do think that they have the capacity to act as guardrails. I also think that um, there is now an acute sense um, among a lot of voters that uh, their vote matters greatly, that um, students, for example, are extremely politicized. They're very, very aware that um, they are personally responsible uh, for uh, protecting democracy, that this is, uh, you know, that really it's, it's important to, to engage. So it's quite interesting that uh, in that sense. Um, now, I, I, I would uh, say that, um, that the Supreme Court, uh, the judiciary and, and Congress uh, have have been crucial uh, right now. The president has actually adopted. Uh, I, I would say that in May there was a there were a lot of people who, including myself, who said this could be a moment of economic rupture. A um, lot of talk about the president not accepting uh, if there was an impeachment vote against him. The president not accepting if the Supreme Court decided that the vote that uh, an annulment of the presidential elections because of illegal party finance. So very clear signs that the, the executive was saying, look, we uh, do not uh, accept any limitations from Congress and the Supreme Court. This has now changed a bit because uh, uh, the judiciary and, uh, and inv police investigations have closed in on several of Bolsonaro's allies. Uh, so he's kind of taken a step back uh, and uh, temporarily paused this anti-democratic uh, rhetoric. So I think these institutions, um, which I've mentioned, but particularly 
uh, looking at uh, the bodies that fight corruption and investigate uh, have been very, very important, I think, to, to, to basically put a check on uh, the president's anti-democratic energy. And, and on top, of course, uh, the media, which continues to be just absolutely crucial uh, to assure that there is an oversight. Thanks, Oliver. I'm glad you mentioned media because it gives me a nice segue to add another layer to, uh, as I turn to Joseph from Indonesia, um, you look at the, the strength of democratic institutions. Can you also talk a bit about the role of social media uh, in the environment in Indonesia? Yeah, very quickly, I'm very mindful we're running out of time. In terms of uh, institutions, I think there are, there are pockets of excellence uh, in Indonesia, the constitutional court, um, the financial institutions, the central bank, the ministry of uh, of finance, um, the, the macroeconomic policies that they have been able to implement are really quite commendable, especially the last few years with uh, how volatile uh, the world has been. Um, the the anti-corruption commission until um, a year ago was also very commendable in terms of their professionalism. Um, but uh, there are some uh, major challenges uh, that the institutions face. Um, in, in Indonesia, uh, institutions, uh, uh, government policy is notorious for flip-flopping, right? Um, so there's a lot of uh, inherent instability there. Um, policy coordination across institutions are very poor. And one of the reasons why that is so, I think, is because um, the, 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 the cabinet, the leadership of ministries has become... Uh, an avenue for compromise and political largesse, right? This is the problem with having uh, a coalition that basically uh, comprises just about every political party there is uh, a rainbow coalition, if you if you will, right? But it also means that you have to distribute the 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 largesse and the the opportunities across all these all these parties, and that has made um, uh, coordination difficult. Not only that. Um, you're not getting technocrats in these positions uh, when you really should, but they're all political uh, appointees. Um, as far as social media is concerned, uh, Indonesia is really one of the most plugged into the internet uh, countries uh, in Asia. And uh, social media has played a, 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 a very decisive role, for better or worse, um, in elections, in uh, campaigns, in the choosing of of uh, uh, candidates, um, you saw this in the in the last election. Uh, uh, Indonesia is a very young uh, country, and it's a very uh, because it's very young. Um, I think you can, in a sense, extra extrapolate from that that um, the the consumption of social media is actually very high um, uh, in Indonesia, one of the highest uh, in uh, in Asia. Thanks, Joseph. Yeah, I'm keeping an eye on the time and also the Q&A box, and I'm becoming more and more concerned about the mental well-being of our attendees uh, after this somewhat downcast conversation. So I don't want to leave everyone that way. Um, so I want to end maybe by giving Sabina and Ted a final word. And I want to turn to you, Sabina, first. Um, the, the BTI report in 2020 isn't, isn't all negative. Uh, there are some, some uh, rays of hope in that bunch. Can you maybe mention a couple of positive stories for people to keep an eye on? Well, what we do see is, is uh, something that has been mentioned before. There are pockets of excellence and institutions who are countervailing trends. Um, that can be Supreme Courts, that can be, in, in, I don't know a case of Parliament actually, um, there can be institutions that are still independent. What is um, visible though too is that there seems to be an alertness of civil society organizations that jump in when other institutions fail and that happens in sometimes very adverse circumstances and even if civil society and the space for civil society has been uh, dramatically re reduced it is um, it differs in, in strategies on how to mobilize it, it um, by social media on the one hand. Um, they seem to react to some of the strategies that autocratic leaders show to, to uh, stop civil society and stop assemblies, etc., etc. Um, so I think that is an, a promising 
hope a, a trend that at least makes me hopeful that that um, maybe the awareness and the 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 sort of um, uh, possibility that we might be a, might have been a bit lenient in the past um, is over. There are some institutions and and other strategies on how to countervail that we know maybe in the future. Thanks, Sabina. Ted, I'm going to turn to you for the final final assessment. I mean, if you've got uh, volume two of your book coming out in the next couple of years, are there any countries that you uh, you think you'd like to write about and we might find in that second volume? Uh, thank you, first of all, everyone for joining us. And it's really been a real honor and pleasure to see you all again and have this conversation. Um, I think, you know, there are a bunch of countries that are interesting that we haven't talked about. Mexico, South Korea come to mind. Um, but unfortunately, it's a pretty short list. And I, I think with all the struggles we're seeing around the world, we're in for a pretty long winter. Um, when it comes to the democratic rule of law values and concerns that we all care about. Um, so I think these countervailing forces that I discussed um, earlier are really critical in the resilience and in institutions that we need um, to uh, strengthen are more important than ever. We see in our um, data that um, civil justice, criminal justice, regulatory reform, open government, these are categories that are actually doing pretty well over five-year trends. And so um, that's encouraging. And, and I guess my final thought is on, you know, here, ask me the question again, as far as the United States is concerned, um, after November 5th, uh, because we're undergoing an enormous stress test in this country. Um, and yes, the pandemic is here, but we're all facing that. But we have an election that's um, really going to determine the future of this country in a way I've never experienced in my lifetime. Um, and I think we'll have some effects around the world as well. Um, so we'll all stay tuned, I'm sure, and look forward to seeing you in the future. Thanks, Ted. Um, just a couple of housekeeping notes before I let everyone go. A uh, recording of this will be available later today and will be circulated to attendees and those who couldn't make it. And then for those who'd like to join us for the next session, uh, our webinar on August 6th uh, will be focused on Asia. So I encourage you all to join us then and keep an eye out for the invitation. Uh, in the meantime, this has been a lot to digest. It's been a wonderful conversation. I'm going to sit quietly in my room now and try to try to absorb everything that we learned today. Um, and I really just want to thank all of you for being here, for the participants, uh, for, for staying in overtime. Uh, to my colleagues, Sabina Donner at the BTI, at the Bertelsmann Stiftung, to our wonderful partners at the World Justice Project and Ted Pacone, thank you for marshalling this discussion. And to our panelists, Joseph, Tino, Seda, Elizabeth, and Oliver, thank you all very much. I wish you all a safe, wonderful, healthy day. Take care now. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.